all of you unconventional conventionists. Welcome back to Rocky Talkie. It's a Rocky Horror Podcast where we talk about anything and everything. Rocky Horror. My name is John. I'm Jacob. And I'm Aaron. Jacob, Aaron, how y'all doing? Before we get started with the show, like, let's just take a moment and ask each other, just, how was your week? Did you get up to anything fun? Jacob, what'd you do this past week? Um, this past week, I started coding boot camp. It's been a, it's been such a blast. Last night, uh, along with Aaron and our lovely producer Meg, I went out to a like open mic vaudeville esque type show. I had quite a blast, and it was at like this Italian bakery that was like super tiny and had a bunch of really cool menu items. I got an egg cream croissant. And I'd never had one of those before. It was dope. It was like shape, croissant shaped, filled with like yellow jelly. Like it was almost like a donut filled with stuff, except a croissant filled with stuff. It was delicious. And it only cost like four bucks, which is fucking bonkers. Um, and there was comedy, which was pretty cool. Yeah. I'll give you a egg cream. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, right up my egg holder. Yeah. Aaron. What did you do this week? Not egg cream, that's for damn sure. Boring. Yeah, no, this week was um was mostly work for me. Um I did uh, I did have a dentist visit on Wednesday. So that was fun. Um was it no. Oh, no. No, they had had to had to get some uh, some cavities filled. I actually have Three more dentist visits in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. But Aaron, you love the dentist. Oh, I love it so much. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, it was uh, it was fine. It was just, you know, a little numb uh, from that one. Um, but yeah, no, I uh, went out last night. Like Jacob said, that was super cool. Uh, got to see some stuff and uh, had a good time. Had a good time. What about you, John? What have you been up to? So this past Thursday, I was able to go see the opening night of a show at the public theater called Fat Ham, which is a show that my partner Savannah is currently the uh, hair and makeup supervisor for. And I have heard a lot about this show uh, from Savannah and from just like random emails that I've been getting from like Theater Mania, Broadway World, stuff like that. It most recently just won the Pulitzer Prize for drama, which... Oh, wow. like, yeah, which is like basically like the Oscars for books kind of thing. <laughs> um, there have only been a handful of stage performances that have won the Pulitzer, namely Hamilton, Next to Normal, A Strange Loop, which is a show that's on Broadway right now. There's like a bunch of there's like a small handful of shows that have won the Pulitzer Prize for drama and Fat Ham won. It is a fat queer black retelling of hamlet and it was simultaneously one of the funniest and one of the most like imprinted pieces of theater i think i've ever seen it was incredible uh tickets are going really fast uh because it did win the pulitzer prize which means that everybody and their mother is trying to see it right now but if you're able to go to the public theater and you are able to see Fat Ham, go see Fat Ham. It is incredible. It is amazing and wonderful. The cast is amazing. The crew is fantastic. And fingers crossed that it uh, transfers to Broadway. But go see it. It's so good. I can only picture, you know, Hamlet, the classic Shakespearean comedy. <clears throat> yep, um, exactly. Mm. Oh, that sounds awesome. We uh, we just got tickets uh, for Moulin Rouge this week. I'm super pumped to get to finally go see it. I, Ooh, I, yeah. I know I've heard things. I know I've heard things. But you know what? It, it's still a big Broadway show. I can't help but be excited, you know? Yeah, it's it's fun. That's that's all that matters. That's the one thing that I can explain Moulin Rouge as. It's, just, it's, a, it's a fun show. I saw Moulin Rouge for the second time earlier this month, and it was exactly the same as I saw it the first time. And it was fun. Nice. Well, I'm looking forward to that, and... Uh... Maybe we can hit up Seth, see, see if they can hook us up with some of them Fat Ham tickets. Yes, Fat Ham is incredible. Go see Fat Ham. But now that that is out of the way, this is not a Fat Ham podcast. It's a Rocky Horror podcast. So why don't we dive into our first segment? Ba-da-da-da. 
So first up in global news, we've got another incredible announcement from Laverne Cox, who is our Frankenfurter from the 2016 Fox remake. You guys might remember that we spoke about Laverne a few weeks ago when she won a 2022 Webby for Advocate of the Year. We mentioned that as a trans girl, Laverne has done a lot of media firsts. She was the first black trans person to create and star in her own TV show, Transform Me. She was also the first trans person on the cover of Time magazine, as well as the first trans person to be nominated for a primetime Emmy. Now, Laverne is about to check off another first for the trans community. She is about to be the first trans person to have a Barbie doll made in her likeness. And this doll is super cute. She's got like super glammed up hair, makeup, and jewelry, and she's dressed in a dark red corset top and tulle skirt over a silver cat suit. In an interview with People, Laverne, who was very involved in the doll's design process, had stated, I wanted her to wear multiple outfits, but that wasn't cost effective. You want the doll to be affordable, so I was like, what if she had one outfit that could, like, peel off and become multiple outfits? I like that. That's cute. So Laverne went on to discuss the importance of Barbie in her own life, stating that as a kid, I begged my mother for a Barbie doll, and she said no because I was assigned male at birth. When I was in my 30s, I was in therapy and telling my therapist that I was denied the opportunity to play with Barbie dolls. My therapist said, It's never too late to have a happy childhood. What you should do for your inner child is go out and buy yourself a Barbie. I told my mom what my therapist had said, and that first Christmas after that, my mom sent me a Barbie doll. She's been sending me Barbies for Christmas and for my birthday ever since. Damn right, Laverne's mom. You better be sending her Barbies for Christmas, bitch. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, step up. (laughs) Laverne, whose 50th birthday is today, Sunday, May 29th, went on to comment that being involved in the creation of her very own Barbie has been a process of reclaiming my inner child, healing her, giving her what she didn't have the first go-round, giving those things to her now. And Barbie is a very tangible part of that. To be turning 50 years old and be transgender and have a Barbie in my life, that feels just like a full circle kind of healing moment. I hope it'll be healing for all the people who encounter the Laverne Cox tribute Barbie. Laverne continues, I think that in an environment where trans children have been used as political football, when over 250 pieces of anti-trans legislation have been introduced in state legislatures all over the country in 2022 alone, and access to gender-affirming health care has been denied by policies signed into law in my home state of Alabama and Arkansas and other states, that in this environment where trans kids are being attacked, that this is also a celebration of transness and also a space for them to dream, understand, and be reminded that trans is beautiful, that there is hope and possibility for them to be themselves. Aw, that, that's incredibly sweet. Laverne, from all of us here at Rocky Talkie, congratulations. And... Happy birthday! Birthday, birthday, birthday. It's public domain. You can just sing it now. Birthday, birthday, birthday. I see. We're doing it that way. Birthday, For she's birth- a jolly good fellow. <laughs> For she's a jolly good fellow. For she's a jolly good fellow. And now she has a Barbie. <laughs> if you're interested in checking out Laverne's interview with People, we've got that linked for you in our show notes. If you're interested in purchasing her Barbie, you can do that at MattelCreations.com for the low, low cost of only $39.99 in what I am saying, I hope you will understand, is a very ironic tone. (laughs) We've got that link too. By the way, when you visit that website, Laverne's Barbie is first up, front and center. But directly underneath it, they've got a sexy Jeff Goldblum as Ian Malcolm from Jurassic Park Barbie available for pre-order. He's doing the spicy open shirt reclining backwards on the lab table post. You know the one. Just floating that, like, as if it feels relevant to a lot of our listeners. You're not wrong. Where'd you say it was? MattelCreations.com. Tippity-tappity-typity. Go buy 30 of them. (laughs) You know they're going to be on eBay tomorrow, so. Yep. Well, speaking of birthdays, we here at Rocky Talkie would like to wish a very happy one to Patricia Quinn who turned 78 yesterday, May 28th. Jesus Christ, imagine being 78. Couldn't be you. Imagine being Patricia Quinn. If I ever lived to be 60, just just kill me. (laughs) Yikes. Pat, 
who was born in Belfast, Ireland, and was involved in acting from the time she was a little kid, moved to London at 17 to train at the Drama Centre in London while she worked at the Playboy Club dealing blackjack. That's the most surprising part of any of this, that, that Patricia Quinn was wanted at, at the Playboy Club. She was 17, man. All right, yeah, I'm sure there was a time when that was all the rage. Patricia Quinn, sure. No, I, I, I was saying it like it was problematic. Anyway, Patricia oh. is probably best known for her role as, I don't know, Magenta in Rocky Horror, but has acted in a wide array of roles in films and television, including Monty Python's The Meaning of Life, her own story arc in Doctor Who, and more recently, she appeared as Megan in the Rob Zombie film Lords of Salem. Pat has been married twice, first to Don Hawkins, who produced the cinematic classic Underworld, and next to the incredibly prolific British actor Sir Robert Stevens, who was knighted in 1995 for his service to drama. Nowadays, Pat is still obviously heavily involved in the Rocky Horror community. She regularly attends both virtual and IRL conventions, where she signs autographs and does Q&A sessions for the fans. She also attends local Rocky Horror performances from time to time, where she'll show up to help host and will often perform science fiction double feature. Patricia is pretty active on her social media accounts, especially Facebook, where she often makes a point of wishing Rocky Horror community members happy birthday. She's also got an Instagram, a Cameo account, and her own website, patriciaquinn.co.uk, where you can stay up to date on her goings on. We've got those all linked in our show notes if you'd like to check them out. Happy birthday, Pat. We hope you had a phenomenal day with lots of cake, presents, and fun celebrations. And with that, we're going to move on over to some community news. First up in community news, we'd like to extend our warmest congratulations to our most recent guest host, Mix Universe, and their partner, Ponyboy, both from the JCCP cast out in Pittsburgh. They tied the knot this weekend! Yay! We have only gotten to see the most preliminary of social media photos so far, but it looks like you both had a really magical day. Your matching gold outfits are stunning, and your little custom D&D cake topper guys, <laughs> absolutely adorable. Mazel tov on your big day, lovebirds. We can't wait to see even more photos and to give you both big congratulatory hugs next time we see you IRL. Next up, it's June, fuckers. <laughs> that means it's time to dust off all the rainbowed, glittery, sequiny, feathery, gay shit that we all keep tucked away in storage during the other 11 months of the year. Bold of you to assume that we keep it in storage. Yeah, I don't I don't think that tracks at all. So, <laughs> who if, wrote this? <laughs> if you're in or around the New Jersey area and want to kick off Pride Month right, the Ordinary Kids cast in Montclair have got you covered. The Ordinary Kids are going to be holding a free, that's right, free outdoor Shadowcast performance on June 3rd at 8.30 p.m. So slip on those fishnets and bring your lawn chair, or preferably a blanket, for a gay-as-fuck movie night under the stars. I would absolutely hate to sit in a lawn chair in fishnets. Yeah, that sounds kind of unpleasant, actually. That's, um, you're going to get stuck to the chair. Right. It's inevitable. What would the blanket change? I just, I don't know. Why is the fishnets in the lawn chair a problem? I'm so confused by this tangent. I mean, fishnets get caught in everything. And when you have lawn chairs, lawn chairs have a lot of pipes. They have a lot of, like, metal pieces, like small metal bolts sticking out of it that are just ripe to get stuck on. Uh, all right. I'll bring a stool. <laughs> I'm going to bring an armchair. <laughs> you just back up a truck with a full lazy boy in the back of it. <laughs> All right, guys, get the cap. Actually, funny story. The uh, the night of the second Matrix movie premiere, I was standing out front in, like, this podunk town that I lived in, like, in front of the movie theater, lining it up. One of the uh, guys from my high school brings his truck over with a full fucking couch in the back of it, unloads it, and sets it right next to the theater for everybody to sit on waiting in line. Honestly, goals. What a Chad move, yeah. that's. I mean, he got yelled at and he had to take it away, but it was a funny as fuck moment, like... <laughs> Oh, what? You can't have a couch in public, man? Shame. <laughs> Fuck IMAX. 
this is an indoor couch. <laughs> it definitely was not an indoor couch. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. Yeah, right? All right. The performance will include a live pre-show, a live shadow cast, and live salespeople who will happily poffer you a prop bag for the low, low cost of five dollars. If you like the full audience participation experience, they'll also be peddling other wares. They might even have one of their adorable "You're Okay by Me" enamel pins that are bright pink, shaped like lips, and would look hella spiffy on a Frank jacket. We talked about those when they first dropped. It would be a great chance to pick one up. I have one of those, and it is like top, top three of all my Rocky Horror pins. I'd say maybe even top one. Nice. Well, if you're in the New Jersey area, mark your calendars and head on over to the Lackawanna Plaza. Showtime is at 8.30, but doors in this outdoor venue open at 7. So make sure to get there early if you want to snag the best seats. Or bring your own best seat. And of course, all these deets will be linked for you in our show notes. The best seat is my face. Hey! Have a ghoul. Next up, we've got another reason why you, yes you, should be getting excited for RKO4. As though any of us need more reasons to be excited. This week, Lissa from the Tesseract Players of Boston posted to the RKOCon Special Network Group on Facebook to announce that Tesseract's favorite merch item, Asshole and Slut Undies, are now available for pre-order for the low, low price of only 20 American dollars. That is one half of a transgender Barbie, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> or one 150th of a Frank jacket you can proudly display to whatever portion of the world happens to make contact with your underwear on a daily basis that you, yes, you, are a huge asshole and or a huge slut. This is accomplished by splaying our two favorite screams across your hot, hot little booty. These underpants are available in sizes extra small to double X to fit a wide array of booties. But wait, get it? Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Probably There's doesn't work more. in an audio format, does it? Yeah. I, I maybe like but but it but it <laughs> but to t- wait. There's more. These undies are usually only available in black with white piping with a choice of either red or white letters. I know. I like my piping in white. Mm, meow. To break that down for people who can't quite visualize, the undies usually come in a black base fabric with white trim. Then your butt word, asshole or slut, can either be written in white or red letters. I- is that right? Yep, but... To, due to a supply chain issue that we're going to spin into a positive, we are currently overstocked on wacky, waving, inflatable, arm flailing tube pen. No. <laughs> but due to a supply chain issue that we're going to spin into a positive as an extra special con exclusive, ooh, piping is now available in a wide array of colors, including red, yellow, green, maroon, and light blue. The classic white is still available in sizes small through XL and is unfortunately the only piping option in extra small. If you'd like to pre-order your spicy new underoos, there's an order form in the RKO social group page for you to fill out. Just make sure to get your info submitted no later than June 30th so that Tesseract can get them printed. If you do snag a couple, they'll be available for pickup at the con where we can take part in a community-wide hashtag twinning extravaganza. All that info will be linked for you in our show notes, of course. And just one more quick reminder before we close out community news. The deadline to submit your con auditions is June 15th. You've still got a couple of weeks, but if you haven't started yet, this is your reminder. Now is the time. Please get that shit in. You guys are all so fucking awesome, and we cannot wait to perform with you. And with that... Who's hungry? Who wants a little snack? Do you want a snacky, snacky snack? Not if you ask me like that. Dear God, are you gonna? Sounds like I'm gonna get a cum cracker or some shit. Yeah, call me daddy first. <laughs> bum ba dum bum. All right, guys, it's jerkin' time. 
sorry, Jacob. No, 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 no. No jerking this week. We've got a write-in. Oh, come on. I wait all week long, and then you leave me with Neptune nuts. What? Blue balls. Neptune is blue. Oh, uh, that's a stretch. Stretch like your asshole. That watch wasn't going to hide itself. So, this write-in came to us at the start of April, and uh, we have taken our sweet time, and well, I mean, here, John, why don't, why don't you go ahead and read this one? All right, this one is from Justin from RKO, FBC, Test Rec Players of Boston, and NYCRHPS. Jesus, could you have any more acronyms? PhD, MD, D's nuts, whatever. So, Justin writes... Hello, this is somewhat Rocky-related, but I'd love to hear an episode that talks about Jubilee, the 1978 avant-garde glam punk film that stars Richard O'Brien and Little Nell. Not only that, but the main character even states that her favorite song is Don't Dream It Be It, an even further connection to Rocky. It is such a strange cult film that I hardly ever hear anybody talk about it. I'm always even more shocked when Rocky folks haven't heard about it since, one, it's a campy glam rock film that has Rocky cast members playing zany characters, Two, was released not too long after Rocky, and three, deals with Rocky as a direct influence. I know this film isn't necessarily Rocky, but it's very much in the same ballpark. I'd love to hear more about it. I also bring this up since one of the stars, punk legend Pamela Rook, had passed away today. Okay, what the fuck, Justin? Jubilee? I've never... I've never seen it. Why the fuck would I? So I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that the reason nobody talks about it is because it sucks. Hey, I, I, I don't think that's fair. Oh, no, no. It, it sucks. It sucks big donkey balls. Holy crap, you actually watched it? Yes, and might I say, what a waste of an evening. I want my two hours back. It looked too weird for me, no matter how much full frontal male nudity is in it. I'm not even going to pretend like I know what this movie is about, and I just doubt a lot of our listeners do either, so... Lay it out for me. Justin says it's a cult punk rock movie from the late 70s and it's got Richard and Nell in it. That ticks a lot of boxes. Why doesn't the community love this thing? Well, to put it bluntly, Jubilee is an extremely artsy-fartsy movie. Like, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not even sure how I really feel about it. Meg and I watched this thing the other night with our friend Marty and... He very nearly blew his brains out sitting through it. So if you think punk rock art film sounds totally up your alley, well, maybe not. (laughs) What's it about? Go on. I got you. Saddle up. It's a weird one. The movie opens in the late 1500s with Queen Elizabeth I and her court occultist John Dee, played by Richard O'Brien. The parts of the film with the old queen are all Shakespearean in dialogue and tone. So, Richard summons the spirit guide, Ariel. That's the character from William Shakespeare's The Tempest. And he has Ariel bring the trio to a kind of alternate reality modern-day Britain of the 1970s. They are mostly observers to what transpires, as the film really follows the activists of a group of aimless nihilists, mostly young women, including... Amyl Nitrate, Bod, Chaos, Crabs, and Mad. Nell plays Crabs, Toya Wilcox plays Mad, and the punk rock icon Pamela Rook, aka Jordan, plays Amyl Nitrate. I'm sorry, my punk rock encyclopedia has the day off. So I know Nell, and I know that Toya Wilcox performed in the Rocky Horror Tribute Show a few years back, but most of our listeners would recognize her from being the narrator in the Teletubbies. But who... The fuck is Pamela Rook? Justin mentioned that she recently passed? Yeah, she died earlier this year at the beginning of April. She was better known as Jordan or Jordan Mooney. She plays the leader of the Gang of Nihilists in the film. And she was an English model and an actress. She was best known for her work with Vivian Westwood and the Sex Boutique in the King's Road part of London in the mid-70s. She was an iconic fixture at many of the early Sex Pistols shows, and alongside several of those early punk bands, she's credited with kind of creating the London punk aesthetic. So, okay, Queen Elizabeth I and Richard travel to the future 
where we see this group of nihilists going on a slightly less gory, clockwork orange style rampage. We're introduced to a whole host of characters, including Sphinx and Angel, two incestuous bisexual brothers, Bod, a sex-hating anarchist who has just strangled and killed Queen Elizabeth II, stealing her crown in an arbitrary street robbery. Of course there's some incest. You know, I'm starting to feel like this was a lazy 70s writing technique to create quirky characters. I'm not like other girls. I'm incestuous. <laughs> the other boys in this case. Mm. Amal Nitrate pontificates about her own twisted punk manifesto version of the history of the world and reminisces about her time as a ballet dancer. We get an extremely artsy scene of her ballet dancing around a trash fire while naked men in masks stand around dicks a floppin i'm sure it's some grand metaphor or something but but jesus christ it's like shut up it's like i get i get frustrated with the dance scene in oklahoma inside the dream this was like that times 10 <laughs> well shit if i knew that there were dicks Oh, there is plenty of dicks and just nudity in general. So the guy who directed Jubilee, Derek Jarman, was a filmmaker who was really known for pushing the envelope. His previous film, Sebastian, portrays the life of Saint Sebastian, including his iconic martyrdom. And that movie was super gay. Patricia Quinn, Little Nell, and Peter Henwood all have, like, blink-and-you'll-miss-it cameos in the film's opening, which is a crazy homoerotic dance at the court of Roman Emperor Diocletian. Anyway, the movie has a ton of gay iconography, and the Roman soldiers are all depicted in extremely homoerotic situations. See? Why aren't we discussing this movie? This one sounds like a good time. Also, all the dialogue is entirely in Latin. Well, fuck that. So, back to Jubilee. The gang goes to a cafe where Nell picks up a young musician named Kid. This is Adam Ant, who would go on to be the lead singer of the iconic punk rock group Adam and the Ants. Adam being the titular ant. There's not much to say about this part of the movie. Bod attacks a waitress, ripping off her wig, and violently squirts a whole bottle of ketchup in her face. I'm sure that's a metaphor for something. Or it's just run-of-the-mill nihilistic violence. My favorite kind of violence. Did, did she actually squirt the whole bottle of ketchup? Because I feel like that would take a good minute of just squirting ketchup because those are pretty full bottles. Or is that like an overstatement? Like it's just a lot of ketchup on her face, but not the whole bottle. It takes a whole minute. Jesus Christ! That's incredible! What a decision! My God. Nell, squirt the whole thing. Just shake it as much as you need and keep squirting. I'm sure Nell multiple times is like, are you sure this is going to be a fucking while, bro? And the director's like, yeah, just... N Nell's, not even, Nell's not even the one that squirts it. Oh. It's, it's really bad. Whoop. Yeah. Whoops. Still, my God, that's... Whew. This is where <laughs> we're introduced to an impresario named Borgia Gins. Gins is the most Jeff Bezos-looking motherfucker you've ever met. And he seems to have a lot in common with our dear Amazon capitalist king. So this is where we get, in my opinion, the best bit in the entire movie. Amel, Jordan, performs a pastiche of rural Britannia. It's catchy, it's smutty, it's full of, like, iconic and, like, really weird imagery. I mean, it is very, very, very punk. Wait, so is this movie a musical? Not really. Like, there's plenty of iconic punk music in the film, most of it's shown kind of as broadcast TV concert footage, right? The film's from 1976, so we're still a few years away from MTV making music videos part of the mainstream culture. But the idea of musicians creating visual accompaniment for their songs, I mean, that had been fairly prevalent since the late 50s. And, like, David Bowie did a number of his short promotional films with Mick Rock in the early 70s, so... You know, it, it's kind of in this weird in-between phase between when uh, music videos blew up and just kind of you have musicians doing short films. In, in Jubilee, you can see tons of famous punk rockers. Jane County, Adam and the Ants, as we mentioned, The Slits, and The Suey Six and The Banshees. It's kind of a veritable who's who of early British punk rock. So, 
the incestuous brothers, Sphinx and Angel, who we introduced before, develop a relationship with a woman named Viv, a disenfranchised former artist who they introduce to Max, an ex-soldier. Meanwhile, Nell, as Krabs, takes the kid to meet Borgia Gins. But Nell doesn't work for free. The kid has to perform some rather kinky sexual favors for Nell first. It's more violent than sexy, but I think you can say that about most of the movie. So, Gins signs the kid's band under the name Scum. Everyone tries to talk him out of making a deal with the proverbial devil, but the allure of fame is too appealing. This is where we learn that Gins has branched out from just being a music mogul and has started purchasing abandoned properties, abandoned in quotes, such as Westminster Cathedral and Buckingham Palace, which are transformed into musical venues. That's the most Jeff Bezos thing I have ever heard. So, like, okay, this sounds like a reasonable end for Act 2. You've got some batshit crazy characters weaving a really weird web, so now what? Now what? This is where the movie completely goes off the rails. And that clockwork orange kind of thing really shows through. So Nell bangs another guy, and then the group asphyxiate him with, like, red plastic. Uh, it's, it's pretty fucked up, really. Then they break into the flat of an androgynous rock star and throttle them to death. The kid, at a performance at Westminster Cathedral, gets into a fight with a cop before his big TV debut. And then Viv, Sphinx, and Angel and the kid all go to some bingo hall, where then the cops, who are looking for retribution, gun down the incestuous brothers and then murder the kid in a back alley. A cab. Yeah, a cab. A a cab. The women, incensed by the police violence, track down the two cops. Get this, one of them is castrated to death by Mad and Amil, and the other one, after being seduced by Nell, is blown up on his doorstep with a petrol bomb. To cap off the whole thing, our Bezos lookalike Gins takes the four women off to Dorset, an unreconstructed right-wing aristocratic enclave where he signs the gang to a recording contract, thus cementing their final sellout from the punk lifestyle. The whole film is intercut with scenes of Richard O'Brien and Queen Elizabeth I trying to kind of make sense of this anarchy that they're seeing in this modern-day Britain. But honestly, they really don't add that much to the piece. They make a few pointed comments, and then they just kind of return to the 16th century at the end of the movie. What? The actual fuck (sighs) well there you go justin nobody has heard of it because it's a fucking weird art film honestly i wasn't even mildly curious before but now now i really don't give a shit (laughs) yet somehow and this is kind of the thing that blew my mind when i started looking into it This movie is widely regarded as the greatest punk rock film of all time. So stick that one in your pipe and smoke it. What? How? I can't imagine that it was a hit with the punk crowd when it was released. You'd be right. Jane County recalled that at the initial screening, quote, punks were in the audience screaming, this ain't punk! And what a load of bollocks! Because they're British, you know? And shite! Because, you know, a British again. Yeah, I mean, 70s punks had a real anti-intellectual streak, and Jubilee was about as shamelessly artsy as it comes. The dialogue mixes, like, high-flown Elizabethan poetry with punk vernacular. I, I, I think my favorite line is, like, right at the beginning. As a character flops down on this, like, dilapidated mattress, one of the characters exclaims, You clammy slag, you sat on the KY with your fat arse! Man, I hate that. But, I mean, the film itself is inexcusably punk. I mean, maybe not punk how punk wanted to be viewed, but like the impressions of an outsider looking in. The director, Derek Jarman, was not a punk. He was too old. He was 36 when it was made. He was far too posh, and his prior works didn't really even have a small smidge of nihilism in them. 
But the film was shot in just six weeks on location in London and had like a tiny budget of only 200,000 pounds. The producers were constantly raising money from all over the place during production, and it meant that the filming kind of stopped and started. Toya Wilcox even recalled that her character had been at one point completely written out and then got re-added to the film due to budgetary concerns. So the production levels were kind of punk. I mean, it looks like some of the contemporary reviews were positive. Apparently, Variety called Jubilee one of the most original, bold, and exciting films to come out of Britain this decade. But that opinion kind of seems to be in the minority. Vivian Westwood described it as the most boring and therefore disgusting film that she had ever seen. She produced a t-shirt silk screened with her rant against the film, calling Jarman a gay boy jerking off through the titillation of his masochistic tremblings, which I think is going to be my new band name. I don't think it'll fit on the marquee though. Jarman himself, by all accounts, didn't care much about the reviews. While some felt he was a public schoolboy who missed the point of punk, he said, quote, I don't particularly want people to like the film or what it depicts. I simply hope that it makes them feel that something is going on. And that, that sounds about right. I don't particularly want people to like the film or what it depicts. Yes, we should not. <laughs> and I mean, one of the things that German was actually trying to depict in Jubilee was how everybody and everything gets corrupted even the punks who would quote never sell out eventually they did at, at the end of his life uh, german believed that he had been proved right in the second volume of his memoirs uh, titled dancing ledge published in 1993 a year before his death he wrote afterwards the film turned prophetic Dr. D's vision came true. The streets burned in Brixton and Toxteth. This is a reference to the 1981 England riots. Adam Ant was on top of the pops and signed up with Margaret Thatcher to sing at the Falkland Ball. They all signed up in one way or another. German died in 1994 after a long fought battle with AIDS. He was widely regarded as one of the most prolific gay filmmakers of the 70s and 80s, even if his works have not received a lot of accolades. Several musicians created tribute songs to honor him posthumously. Even the band Chumbawamba released a track called A Song for Derek Jarman in 1994, which, frankly, I was surprised to learn that Chumbawamba had more than one song. <laughs> it was a B-side to their homophobia a cappella single, which also turns out that they have at least three songs. Dude, you know Chumbawamba was around making music for like 30 years. They got knocked down. But they got up again. I get knocked out. Fuck. But I get up again. <laughs> so, top thumping aside, I still don't think I really get this thing. Maybe I just don't know enough about punk in general. But Jubilee really seemed like uh, stupid. Yeah, you can't. You can't just like it's really fun. It's I'm sure. I'm sure the director was like, "Oh my god, we're gonna squirt ketchup in a lady's face for a whole minute." And it's gonna mean something, but you can't do that. You don't. It doesn't get to mean something. Just because you have a lady dance around with a bunch of naked men, it doesn't mean anything. It's a, you made a bad movie. You made a bad movie that hides behind artsiness as a mask of like, ooh, look at this cool thing we did. It doesn't really mean anything. It's nothing in particular. Ooh la la. Ooh, we have Richard O'Brien. Isn't that cool? No, no. That's funny. I enjoy. Cool, you, you did the ketchup thing. That's really cool. But I'd rather have seen Adam Sandler do it and laugh at it than you. So, yeah. All right. I, I, I think, and I mean, I didn't love this thing, and I'm not going to defend it too hard, but I, I think a lot of it comes down to context, right? So when the film was made in 1976, it was against a backdrop of Britain's, like, incredibly high youth unemployment. And there was a lot of uneasy race relations both at home and abroad. This was like on the verge of Thatcherism. It's the political platform that emphasizes free markets with restrained government spending and tax cuts, coupled with British nationalism. It was like the 70s payback for the 60s generation. I mean, the echoes of this you can still see in modern UK politics. 
So while their parents may have never had it so good, the punk rock generation had no future. And while the nation held street parties to celebrate the Queen's Silver Jubilee, the Sex Pistols were arrested for performing God Save the Queen on a boat in the Thames. Oh, is that what the title is referencing? The, the Queen's Jubilee? I guess the UK audience would have gotten that. Jubilee came out in the wake of the filth and the fury of punk rock, which was kind of already a fixation for the mainstream British press. Popular culture at this point was at a crossroads, and the new generation of musicians did not seem to be playing by the same rules as the old guard. Jubilee wasn't the only punk film produced in the 70s, but it certainly brought to light all the paradoxes around punk. Jarman's film ruffled a lot of feathers. It became shorthand for everything wrong with punk. Punk was a paradox, and so is Jubilee. Punk has always been messy and hard to pin down. It's a mixture of street fighter and art house, of DIY democracy and post-1968 French theory, of Xerox machines and safety pins. Jubilee, at least, united the art house and the street punk in their distrust of the mass consumer culture prompted by multi-million dollar media conglomerates. So... If you want to talk about why the Rocky audience hasn't really latched on to Jubilee, I think it's all there. Rocky is a weird uh, but pleasant nostalgia trip. Jubilee is kicking your teeth punk aesthetic, simultaneously taking a piss on history and the hypocritical nature of punk itself. The audiences that Rocky is made for find comfort in its songs. But Jubilee holds a mirror up to its audience, and the reflection is anything but flattering. If there's one scene from the film that kind of sums it up best, Jordan's character, Amyl Nitrate, dreams of an England that, quote, slowly sank into the sea, while the rest of the world sighed, a sigh of relief, to be rid of them and got on with their own business. So this idea of a nation sinking under the weight of its own delusions as the world around it continues to turn, like that still resonates today, not just in the UK, but everywhere in the world. It's kind of evocative of punk itself, which has drifted out of much of the social consciousness, or at least been swallowed up by the countercultures that have come since. It's a weighty subject and an uncomfortable piece of art that does not present a feel-good story for the punks that it's supposed to iconically represent. I mean, it's kind of no wonder that it struggles even today to find an audience because it's inherently hostile towards the ideology that it represents. As Rolling Stone's Sam Adams wrote in 2016, Jarman's suggestion that even the most vocal nihilists would sell out their ideals if given enough encouragement, naturally provided a glimpse of the future. And that's our show. As always, we'd like to thank our editor, Aaron from Tennessee. You're the best, homie. And we'd also like to thank Justin for writing in with such a stupid fucking question. If anyone has a stupid fucking question that they'd like us to answer on air for our Ask a Question segment, or some community news that they'd like us to talk about, or even maybe a cool story that you want to share with the community, you know we'd love to include it in our show. Just go to our website, that's rockytalkypodcast.com, and fill out the contact form to tell us all about it. And, of course, if you're enjoying Rocky Talkie, please help us out by rating, reviewing, and subscribing to the show. It makes the podcast more accessible to new listeners, which really helps us grow the show. And if you want even more Rocky Talkie content, check us out on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, all at Rocky Talkie Podcast. We'll talk to you next week. And bye! 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 Cool. fucking two-hour movie i had to watch you enjoyed it not really it was real bad <laughs> we'd like to extend <clears throat> we'd like uh-huh. to extend our warm <laughs> god damn it tops in 2016 the rocky horror picture show faq everything left dot pdf bangle and barton still the feast is feeding 40 years of rocky horror dot pdf all right guys it's jerkin time can you retake that without blowing it out and do it as the like it's morphin time thing 
Yeah, yeah, I got you. Thompson 2016, the Rocky Horror Picture Show epic. Son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, I don't know what you mean by Morphin Time. Like the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, like the Morpheus meme that's going around. Yeah, but how do they how do they say it? It's jerkin' time. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, uh, that's a stretch. Stretched like your asshole. That watch wasn't gonna hide what? That watch wasn't gonna hide itself. Because you had to put it in your asshole. Yes. It's a reference to... What is that, Pulp that time Fiction? Aaron had to hide a watch in his asshole. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right? Pulp Fiction, yeah. yeah. That's actually... Yeah, that tracks. Yeah. More like poop fiction. <laughs> what? More like feet fiction, because uh, nice. Tarantino. Nice. The women are a scrunchy group of nihilists trekking about town, incensed by the police violence, track down the two cops. One is castrated to death. <laughs> uh, I got it. Yeah. I have to read that like I'm not surprised. All right. Got to hate when that happens. 